Okay, students, I'm going to show you this energy um, transfer with owl pellets. I'm going to also post pictures of this and what you need to do, but I know some of you have been gone for volleyball or soccer or whatever, so I quickly wanted to go through and explain how to do this part of the lab book. Okay, so here we have um, some mock data. I just made up that this uh, owl pellet had two mice, one mole, one shrew, and one bird, no rats. So when I did the math, okay, it told me how many it eats per day. You just multiply this number times two and a half, and then you're gonna multiply those by 365, okay? I kind of changed what I wanted to do here. I wanted to do more animals, so that would be the number there. Okay, then here it says, draw the shape that most biology textbooks use to illustrate food pyramids. So here's what most biology textbooks would show, something like that, okay? And then it tells you up here, sorry, on number two, it tells you to create a two-level numbers pyramid. So let me show you what I did here. Again, this will be on, on the pictures, but um, there's only one owl, and there was, oh, I changed the number. There's really 4,000, 4,562, okay, of the primary consumer. So we're just showing these two levels of the um, of the food pyramid. We didn't show the, the producers, which would be down here. Okay, and we notice that at least 90% of energy is lost here, but that's not exactly coming out to be that with the numbers. So we're gonna do, um, in the bottom, they're gonna have you do that with um, kilograms, with biomass or biota. Okay, so it says, how is the pyramid you drew different? So how is this pyramid different from this pyramid. And the way that they're different is the one we drew on page 64 shows energy transfer. I didn't spell that right, transfer. And the one right here does not. Okay, this just shows a general idea, but the other one shows more of a, a larger energy transfer. Okay, the producer level of the numbers pyramid was not included. How could you find the number for the, how could the number for the producer's level be found? We'd probably just multiply by 10 and that would give us an idea because we know that there has to be at least 10 times as many producers to support that level of primary consumer. Okay, then here I took these numbers and I moved them down here, okay? And then I multiplied across, so this number times this number gives me this number. And then I added those up. Again, I kind of changed the numbers I wanted to use, but this gave me a total kilogram mass of 109 uh, kilograms of the prey. Prey, when they're talking about prey in this, they're talking about the mice and the voles and the rats and the birds, okay? So that's giving me a total of 109 kilograms of the prey, those primary consumers. Then they're having us multiply this times the amount of producers eaten by that prey. And this is giving us these numbers. Okay, so this times this gives us this. And then we add those up. And when we add those up, we get 27, almost 28, thousand kilograms of producers. Remember, producers are trees and and shrubs and grass and berries, okay? Producers, these are things that do photosynthesis. So you can see we got 27-ish thousand compared to 100, okay? And um, compared to one L, okay? So that's gonna give you that biomass comparison. Okay, so now it says here, we're gonna use those calculations that we just made here, and we're gonna make a biomass pyramid. Okay, and the biomass pyramid is going to be right here. Okay, and what I try to do is I try to make it to scale. <laughs> so since I had 27 and a half thousand um, producers, this is producers, producers, since I had 27,000 producers, I decided to make each one of these boxes worth 100. So I used pretty much all the boxes <laughs> for producers. All of this was producers, okay? And then I did, because this is 276 boxes-ish, 276, really it's 275 boxes. 
um, to represent the producers. Then I had to make, since I was doing about 100 um, kilograms per box for the primary consumers, the mice, the voles, all that, I just did one box. And then for the owl, there's only one owl, and so I just did one little tiny itty bitty tenth of or hundredth of a box. <laughs> okay, so I did a hundredth of a box. So you can see there's 27,000 represented here, 100 represented here, and one represented here. So that kind of gives you an idea. It's not perfect, but it kind of gives you an idea of the scale of change from each level of consumer from the producers. Okay, then going to the questions. It says, does the shape of the pyramid illustrate the concept of ecological efficiency of 10%? Yes, it's actually in this situation worse than 10%, right? We're seeing a bigger change than 10%, but it's at least showing that 90% or more of the energy is just being lost to heat or entropy. Okay, the next question, which of these two pyramids better represents this concept? Well, they're both pretty good. Um, the, the second one shows a pretty good ratio. If you look here, okay, we're looking at a pretty good ratio. We're doing 100 to 1. It really should be like 100 to 10, right? So we're, this is a fairly close ratio of the 10% uh, rule. This is way big, right, compared to that. But the whole idea that we're get, trying to get you to see from this is it takes a lot of producers to support the primary consumers. It takes a lot of primary consumers to support the secondary consumer. And that loss of heat is at least 90%. So hopefully those are getting you to visually see that. And please remember that 10% rule. Okay, so I wrote the second one shows a good ratio of primary consumers to secondary consumers with at least 90% lost of energy. Okay, what is the relationship between the mass of the prey and the mass of the producers it eats? It takes 253 times its own mass to feed one of the prey. Okay, so that's kind of showing you that difference between that, uh, that uh, producer level, this producer level here, up into the primary consumer or prey level, okay? This is a huge thing. It takes 253 times its own mass to feed one of its prey. So um, yeah, there's a huge, as far as biomass, there's a huge change. Okay, the next question says, would the mass of producers consumed increase or decrease as the pellet collection location goes from the equator towards the poles? So you just have to remember that there's a lot more production that happens closer to the poles. The weather and the conditions are generally just better. And so at the equator, there is overall, is overall the best location for the growth of producers. So if you're at the, um, at your, if you're at the equator, you're gonna have more producers. The further up you go, I mean, think about the tundra, right? In Northern Canada, we're looking at very low productivity. So we're gonna see fewer, fewer producers there. Okay, so then it asks you to read through all of this and it asks you to make a food web. So my food web is not fantastic, but I can show you kind of what I did to give you an idea. <laughs> okay, one thing I wanted to point out to you that on the food web, the energy arrows have to go from the consumed, from the prey, to the consumer or predator. So a rat will eat the insects, so we're putting the arrows from the insects to the rat because the arrow shows energy transfer, okay? The worms are being eaten by the shrew, so we sh make sure the arrow is that way. I actually, at the class I took this summer, they said that was one of the number one problems they've seen on the AP test is students didn't know which way the arrows went on food webs. <laughs> okay, so make sure your arrows go the right way. If an owl eats a mouse, the energy goes from the mouse to the owl. All right. So we drew, I drew that lovely, lovely food web. I'm such an artist. <laughs> you guys can do better, I'm sure. Okay. Um, make sure you read all this, okay, and make sure that you um, know all the things. It talks about how the arrow should go from the food to the 
um, predator or feeder, okay? Make the, sure the owl's the top consumer, label prey, okay? Um, label consumers eaten by the prey, just do all this. I, I kind of rushed through mine a little bit because I want to make this video tonight. So make sure you're doing all these things, okay? Why are the arrows pointing toward the top of the food web? This is the direction the energy flows through a food web from producer to prey to predator. Okay, I probably should have added producer, but pr technically producer is prey, right? It's being eaten. How does this relate to the shape of either pyramid? There are fewer organisms on top of the food web, just like a pyramid. Okay. What happens to the number of producers if there is plenty of sunshine and rain? Okay, producers can grow very fast uh, when there's plenty of sunshine and rain. That gives us fewer limiting factors because a lot of times rain can be a limiting factor. So the more rain and sunshine it gets, then typically the producers do better. Uh, what therefore happens to the number of consumers if there's plenty of sunshine and rain? If there's plenty of sunshine and rain to the consumer, there's plenty of producers, plants, and so they can have plenty of food and grow and reproduce well. Okay, does the change, and this was a typo. I don't know why we have that typo there, but what they mean is the change in 15 and 16. So does the change in numbers in 15 and 16 occur at the same time? Why? And we haven't talked about this yet because we're going to talk about this a lot. We talk about population growth, but this is a good time to kind of think about this. But no, typically a consumer's population growth lags behind the prey's growth. So typically, if the plants do well, it takes a month or two or sometimes even a year for the plants to do well. And then you see a growth in the population of things that eat the plants. If you see um, a really big mouse population one year, then typically lagging behind either months or years, you're going to see a really good growth of the owl population because they have plenty of food to eat. Okay, so typically um, we see that lag behind. 18. What happens to the number of owls if there's plenty of sunshine and rain? They will have more food and, and they will be able to grow and reproduce well, right? So if there's plenty of plants, we're going to get plenty of mice. If there's plenty of mice, we're going to get plenty of owls, right? There's, there's going to be growth of all of them. It's just that each level, it lags a little bit behind the level before. And again, we'll talk about that a lot more when we talk about uh, populations. Okay. Does the change in numbers 15, 16, and 18, again, another typo, occur at the same time and why? Predators' growth always lags behind the growth of the prey. Okay? So no, we're not going to see the change exactly at the same time. We're going to see it lag behind. And when we do populations, I'll even show you graphs on this. So that'll help make sense on that. Okay, look at the series of changes represented in 15, 16, and 18. Does this demonstrate a positive or negative feedback loop? Okay, in this particular in instance, now we're not talking about what's going to happen later when there's probably going to be a crash. That's next. But for this particular set of situations, this is a positive feedback loop because there's amplification in the populations because of favor favorable conditions. So you can see I jumped over here to page 65 and I drew that positive feedback loop. So we have lots of rain and sun. So lots of plants grow. So lots of food for mice and voles and rats because there's lots of plants to eat. So they reproduce more. Therefore, there's more owls because they can eat more mice. So we see this positive amplification. We see more, more plants. We see more mice. We see more owls. So that's a positive feedback loop and amplification. Okay, what would happen to, let me get here, what would happen to the number of prey if the owl was removed due to something like a habitat destruction? Okay, if the owl was removed or exterminated or killed or something, then the prey, the mice and the voles and the little birds, they would grow a lot because there's no predator control or suppress the population. So if, if you lose the wolves, you're going to see explosion of moose and deer and elk. If you lose the owl, you're going to see an explosion of little snakes and little mice. Okay. What would happen to the number of producers 
in that situation. So let's say the owls are killed off and, and hunted down. We have an explosion of mice and rats. We're probably going to see that the producers, the plants, are probably going to be overeaten and have a hard time bouncing back. You can overgraze, okay? This actually has happened in certain islands in certain places where they have like removed wolves, for example, and then the moose overgraze because the moose, there's so many moose, they have a huge explosion in their population. They overgraze and then they are... Um, they eat basically their trees and the grasses so much that they can't bounce back. It takes a year or two or three to bounce back. And so we see a lot of moose die the next year because there's no grass to eat. Okay, so that's probably what would happen here is uh, these mice would overeat everything and we'd see a collapse in the producers for a while. Okay, 23. How would this change the numbers, the shape of the numbers pyramid? Okay, the primary consumer level would grow too big. Whoops, I didn't spell that right. Let's do, let's make it too big, too big. The primary consumer level would grow too big because of a population explosion of, um, of the mice and that, okay? 24, how would this change the shape of the biomass pyramid? The biomass of primary consumers would rise and the biomass of producers would fall because of overeating of the plants. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you. If not, ask. We'll, we'll solve that question. Would this cause the collapse of the food web? Actually, yes, this could cause a, a habitat destruction. The primary consumers could collapse population with no producers to eat. So this has actually happened in some areas where they have, for example, they've uh, removed sea otters. They've overhunted them or overharvested them in um, the ocean and they've killed off the sea otters, mostly for their pelts. And that what's happened is the sea otters eat the sea urchins. And the sea urchins are not controlled anymore, so they grow out of control. And the sea urchins consume kelp and other things, producers in the ocean. And as they do that, they overgraze the kelp and it collapses the kelp, which then collapses the whole ecosystem, okay? And so it causes a huge issue when you remove um, that it, it causes a huge issue for the whole food web. 26, review the change represented in 21. Does this demonstrate a positive or negative feedback loop? Okay, so I put negative feedback loop because this regulates the population. So let me show you this, okay, because this is going to be an important negative feedback loop when we talk about populations. So the first thing that happens is grass grows. So the mice eat and they grow and reproduce. Then there becomes too many mice and the mice eat too many of the plants. Okay, um, there's low plant life because the plants have been killed off the next year. So the next year we don't have nearly as many plants. So the mice starve and die because <laughs> there's no plants to eat. So there's fewer mice the next year, less mice to eat the grass, and so the grass grows again and bounces back. Okay, and this regulates this loop. It's a regulatory loop, okay? All right. Which organism is probably responsible for keeping the food web and the pyramids in their respective shapes? Okay, the earth is an open system for energy. Explain what this means using evidence from the pyramids. Okay, those top predators, such as wolves and owls that we've been talking about, control the regulation of the food web. And I've been talking about that the whole time, right? If you do not have a suppression or control of those primary consumers, they can overeat the producers and cause big issues. So we have to control those primary consumers so that we can control the entire food web, okay? It makes sure those populations stay in check to keep systems healthy. Okay, this is a really important question. How do your pyramids and food webs demonstrate the first and second laws of thermodynamics in this particular ecosystem? Okay, I actually put these in the wrong order because I mixed them up. So let's go to the first law first. The first law is entropy. Okay, I mean, not entropy. Energy and matter cannot be created or destroyed. Geez, I did it again. The first law is matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed. Okay, so think about it. The light and the sun... Um, is made for, through photosynthesis into producers. Producers transfer energy into consumers. Consumer transfer energy into secondary consumers, etc. So there is energy transfer. 
all through it. It's, there's, it's not created or destroyed, but energy simply transfers through the system, okay? The second law is entropy, okay? And entropy means that most of your energy that is in a system is going to go towards entropy, towards disorder, towards heat, right? Hopefully you learned that from physical science, hopefully in eighth grade, <laughs> okay? But um, the default is to go towards disorder or entropy or heat. Heat is the most um, unorganized type of energy. So at each level of consuming, there is 90% of energy lost. This coincides with the principle of entropy. Okay, so if we go here and you look at this little um, uh, pyramid that we created here, Going from the mice and the voles and everything, we're going to see at least 50% of energy loss to heat and only 10%, sometimes even less, of that energy transferred to the next level. Okay, that coincides. This is the law, first law of, uh, second law, my goodness, I keep saying it wrong. The second law of thermodynamics is that most energy is going to be lost to heat. Okay, and so in a way that's good for us, right? We want to stay warm. <laughs> We're warm-blooded animals. And so um, it's not all bad, but it does mean that the higher up on the food pyramid you eat, the uh, more food you have to eat because uh, we lose so much energy. Okay, so here are the conclusion questions, these four here. And I, this is more your opinion. What did you learn about food webs and pyramids? So just write something you learned there. Okay, so you can write whatever you want right here. What did you learn about the flow of energy and cycling of matter? Well, hopefully you learned that energy th flows through ecosystems, but you'll also learn that a lot is lost to energy. Here, why do chemists and physicists say that energy is never destroyed or only transformed to another form? Okay, hopefully you can talk about that, that energy is transformed. Um, think about it, uh, light is a certain kind of energy, right? Heat from the sun and light from the sun is a certain kind of energy that is then harnessed into producers, which it goes into biological energy. So here we have like light energy going to biological energy, um, into sugars, which then is transferred into sugars and proteins that are needed for consumers and that kind of thing. So you can see the energy is transferred. Why do chemists and physicists say matter is never destroyed and only transformed into another form? Does your data support this? Remember, um, matter can be... Uh, created and, or it cannot be created or destroyed, but it can transfer, okay? It can transfer into other matters. So just answer those questions. These are a little bit more your opinion, so I didn't write anything there, and I'm sure you guys can come up with something brilliant. Okay, so I'll, I'll take pictures of all this, and I'll post it, and hopefully that helps you fill this out just in case you weren't in class and we discussed it. Thanks, guys.